सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली I'm with Fyodor Lukyanov, the editor of the Russia and Global Affairs magazine, the chairman of the Council on Foreign and Defense Policy Presidium, an authoritative and credible voice in Russia on Russia's foreign policy, and with deep connections to the Russian state, especially to the Kremlin. Welcome, Mr. Lukyanov, to the print. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Lukyanov, we are uh, nearing the first anniversary of the Russian invasion in Ukraine. I spoke to you exactly a year ago on the eve of the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. So much has happened in the world. Uh, a lot of people say the world has changed. But before I ask you whether or not the world has indeed changed, I do want to give you some statistics that the UN HCR, which is the UN uh, High Commissioner for Refugees, as well as for human rights, and these are some casualty figures, both in Ukraine as well as Russian military casualties. And according to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, at least 18,955 civilians have lost their lives uh, in Ukraine. These are all civilian casualties, and because the war is being fought in Ukraine, there are only civilian casualties in Ukraine, of course. And according to your own uh, Defense Minister from September 21, 2022, last year, about six months ago, Sergei Shoigu said. That about six thousand Russian troops had been killed. So the short question is: Is the war? Has the war been worth it? With so many people dying on both sides. You know, this is a <clears throat> rather a philosophical question, which can be referred to any war, any country in history fought. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the uh, human cost and human result of. Uh, what uh, has started to happen a year ago is incredible this is a huge tragedy uh, for people for countries for families for for anybody oh. especially given the fact that this conflict has a, a significant dimension as a civil war mm -hmm. of course the uh, my counterparts in ukraine would uh, deny it because the uh identity which uh is now being um, uh, developed in ukraine uh is based on the idea that ukrainians and russians are completely different people mm -hmm. but in fact uh the interconnection between those two nations is so incredibly uh tight and uh on all levels uh historically religiously why would you uh, so why would you kill people or why would you kill people of a country that are so close to you histor historically and culturally and in so many other ways uh, it's not about kill people uh which are so close to uh that's about a huge international crisis which unfortunately started uh inside this cultural and historical uh territory mm -hmm. But of course, uh, the uh, of course, the roots of this conflict, roots of this uh, this war, are much deeper than just relationship between Moscow and Kiev or between Russians and Ukrainians. And uh, that's again, it's a great tragedy that uh, these balances of international order, uh, which uh, emerged uh, after the Cold War they were so severely displayed exactly here but at the so same you're, time you're basically what, saying you're basically saying that the conflict has been worth it despite the number of people who have died no i didn't say this so please don't uh, subscribe to me what i didn't say okay i say that unfortunately many wars are uh, should be avoided but it's impossible because of the nature of international politics and the power relationships so you could not avoid this conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, that's very difficult to judge. Uh, personally, I think that, uh, uh, of course, the decision which has been made a year ago 
uh, could be altered and uh, at least at that point or probably a bit uh, earlier than that point uh, we had some <coughs> crossroads uh, not only Russia but everybody had those crossroads which uh, were uh, used uh, in in a wrong way but at, <coughs> at the point when it started the tension was uh, incredibly high and as we see now a year after yeah. uh, all claims on the Russian side that uh, for several years at least for eight years before this war started the West prepared Ukraine for war with Russia and those claims were attributed or by many of us before to the propaganda stuff but we see now it it, it was the case it was fact and uh, the West is now proud of that so what are you saying that this is really a proxy war between Russia and the US uh, that's very complex conflict uh, with many uh, levels but uh, at the end of the day this is a proxy war it's not proxy actually Pro proxy means that both sides uh, fight uh, through uh, agents mm -hmm. but it's not the case here russia is fighting itself uh, with the own people and own everything while united states uh, and the west uh, in general but in particular united states uh, is fighting through 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 the proxy through to ukrainians and uh, that's why this this conflict is extremely uh, tricky and complicated because in fact what we have we have a, a severe confrontation between two nuclear superpowers two nuclear superpowers mm -hmm. where one superpower fights itself another superpower indirectly but very intensively so, you know, for uh, people like us sitting far away, and of course, India has been very deeply affected by the war in Ukraine, as has the rest of the world, and we'll come to that. But let me just explain it how I see it, which is that Russia invaded Ukraine a year ago. America is using Ukraine as a proxy to fight the Russians. Both are nuclear superpowers. Anything can happen at any time. I mean, God forbid something happens. But the fact is that you are... Um, fighting inside Ukraine, people are being killed, Russian troops are killing Ukrainians. But really, after a full year, after so many people have died, it's, it's practically a stalemate. We don't really know where this, is thing, where this is going. Yes, it's a stalemate at this point. And uh, of course, both sides uh, uh, hope and expect that the next period, next couple of months probably, Mm -hmm. might be a breakthrough both russian side and ukrainian side uh, believe that they are they will be able to uh, conduct this breakthrough mm -hmm. i'm not sure it will happen but uh, you know the logic of uh, the whole confrontation the logic of the whole warfare is now uh, very clear and uh, recently we heard uh, uh, several statements in munich for example uh, starting from President Zelensky, then you name it. Everybody there from the West uh, said uh, basically the same. Mm -hmm. Russia should be defeated. Russia should be uh, destroyed as a great power. Russia should lose any opportunity to uh, to pose a threat to anybody. And that's the ultimate goal. You know, with such a formulation, however we, uh, we uh, assess uh, Russian behavior, but after such words, what one can expect from uh, from a great power, how it will act. So how do Russians see this then when you hear the world or when you hear the West saying to you that Russia should be defeated, that the Russian people, oh, well, they don't talk about the Russian people. They talk about your president, Vladimir Putin, and they talk, they about, talk Russia. about Russia. I'm sorry. They don't talk about Putin anymore. They talk about Russia, including Russian people. So how do the Russian people perceive this? Is it is it once again a Cold War type of antagonism or enmity between the Russians and the West? Or how, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a new world. It's a new world order. But how do the Russians looking at it? Uh, you know, that, that's very difficult to assess public opinion during, uh, during such a um, uh, uh, stage of, uh, of hostilities. Uh, but uh, it looks uh, based on what we have from polls and based on what I what I feel here being uh, being uh, uh, in Moscow, uh, it looks that that uh, 
that part of society which was uh, <clears throat> extremely against uh, the warfare and against uh, the decision uh, Putin made uh, uh, February 22, they basically left. Uh, according to different uh, estimations, uh, up to uh, seven, eight hundred thousands of Russians left Russia in two wave, waves, uh, first in uh, February, March, and then in September, October. Uh, and that was the, the part of society which theoretically could shape a core of resistance to this war. Those who, who left, uh, they no, it does not mean that everybody is happy, not at all. But the Western reaction, which started uh, immediately after uh, the uh, campaign started, and then escalated over all year, mm -hmm. actually convinced even those in Russia who are not very uh, enthusiastic, to put it mildly, about this war, that we had no choice, but uh, the whole Western world is against us. And I, I would love to underscore it. It's not about Putin's regime anymore. Listen what, uh, what uh, people in Europe or in the United States say. They don't, uh, 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 they don't talk about Putin. Any okay, they talk about Putin all the time. Right. But it's strategic defeat. It's not about Putin. It's about, about the country. And I would say that it had a very big impact on uh, a mood in, inside the country. Again, not, a, not everybody is very happy about what is happening. But after Western reaction, the conclusion is uh, what else we, we have to do. We, we should fight and survive. So, in a, so what you, are you saying then that the West wanted to or wants to strategically defeat Russia or to break it up, make it a weak country which it can control? Uh, I think yes. Uh, of course, uh, you certainly can find different views on how, how much Russia should be defeated and what the strategic defeat would mean. But uh, it would it it is absolutely natural to expect from the U.S. and and allies that they would love to use this situation to weaken Russia uh, profoundly for decades to come, at least. But in a so sense, the, then, Mr. Lukyanov, your president, Vladimir Putin, you fell for the, you fell into a trap that the West laid out for you, which is that you walked into this war. Uh, so many people have been killed. Your economy is damaged. Uh, you were very much part of the whole Western order after the breakup of the Soviet Union over the last 30 years. But you're no longer that now. Yes, uh, no longer that now. Uh, whether it was a trap, uh, that's an interesting hypothesis. And I think that history, uh, decades after us, historians will write about this. And probably some of them will, will uh, state exactly that it was a, a very uh, smart trap uh, established for Russia and for Putin. Uh, we will learn. Or what do you think? Children. Uh, I think it was not as uh, linear because uh, that's an illusion to believe that any politicians operate uh, operate rationally and calculated only. Mm -hmm. In the most cases, it's not not at all the case. It's it's like like uh, uh, emotional and uh, biased and uh, wrong perceptions and so on. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, uh, you, you mentioned the Western order. Uh, Russia was part of that. Uh, that's absolutely correct. But, you know, that's the point, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the conclusion which Putin made, and this conclusion is shared by many here, was that the, the, the idea which emerged, actually, uh, in the late the years of Soviet Union, but especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union, that Russia should become part of the Western order, Western-led order, this idea, that idea was basically wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, some people believe that it would be great theoretically, but it is absolutely impossible because the West would never accept Russia as it is. Mm -hmm. Some other believe that it was wrong uh, even uh, conceptually because uh, Russia as independent part of international picture, international landscape, is essential for international stability, to keep it. 
Okay. Uh, however, however, I think that you 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 touched upon the most important point. This conflict from our side is not only about Ukraine, not only about um, international order. It's uh, mainly about ourselves. How Ru what is Russia and how Russia should develop? So, what is Russia? I don't know. Sorry, uh, the Russian philosophers tried to identify it since 80th century. I, I'm <laughs> okay. not qualified. I no, think no. that the, you know, you know, if you if you uh, read or watch uh, the recent statement, the recent speech by Vladimir Putin, the annual address to federal federal assembly. I did that. Uh, yeah. Yes, everybody noticed the the last the last uh, part about. Uh, uh, start uh, at withdrawal from this nuclear treaty, which, from my point of view, is the least interesting there, because it it was it was expected, and uh, those treaties are, so to say, uh, out of function anyway. Mm -hmm. But if you read, if you look at the the main speech, it's not about the world. It's not about the West. It's not about the East. It's not about the world order. It's about Russia that Russia should uh, explore its potential, Russia should rely on itself, Russia should uh, use all opportunities it has and not expect uh, any uh, sources for development from the outside. And this is, I think, uh, uh, cautious, uh, I, uh, and this is, I think, the, the main idea which Putin now wants to deliver to the nation. That, uh, of course, we, we are at war. We are in a very difficult uh, situation with, with the West. But as he states all the time, it, it will be overcome. So the main thing is how we develop ourselves. And we should develop uh, our potential because in the world to come, uh, interconnection, interdependence, and uh, opportunity to use uh, sources for development from the outside will be very limited. So uh, let me try and understand this. So in a sense, Russia wants to find itself. Are you saying that Russia went to war because it wants to rediscover its own value, its own strength, uh, its right to be strong? In fact, Putin said in that speech that you just quoted, and he, and he quotes this, uh, I think, 19th century historian or philosopher called Stolypin, where he says it's the right of, the historic right of Russia to be a strong nation. But does this mean then that, that the idea of strength is an alternative idea. It's not a Western idea, but Russia wants to evolve its own ideas. Is, is that what you're saying? So Russia went to war not to find itself. It would be a very uh, strong statement. Uh, Russia went to war uh, because of a uh, very deep conflict uh, with, the, uh, with the West about how to perceive how to uh, interpret the the notion of security mm -hmm. uh, you might argue that russian uh, russian uh, approach russian attitude before this war uh, was wrong and paranoid and so that that russia overestimated the threat maybe mm -hmm. but first first of all that was how russia saw uh, things happening from the beginning, from actually collapse of the Soviet Union, and Russia told many, many, many times to the West that something, something went wrong, and we need to discuss it. Yeltsin did it, Putin did it at many occasions. No one wanted to listen. So the West was not, and the West was not willing to consider Russia as an equal. Uh, not just an equal, but to consider Russia as a as a country, as a power. Uh, whose interest, uh, security interest, should be taken seriously. Because what we heard all, all those years, oh, come on, you're wrong. It's not uh, how you feel it, it's wrong. That's it. Okay, great. But but uh, since a big power feels in this way, it cannot be ignored. Mm -hmm. But uh, the se second thing which which uh, I, I would uh, would like to, to stress uh, about, uh, uh, you know, such crisis situations as we have now, uh, explore so many fantastic uh, think, things uh, of sincerity. Mm -hmm. Now, when uh, all those involved in Minsk process, Angela Merkel, Francois Hollande, uh, Boris Johnson on behalf of, 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 of the UK, 
Poroshenko, everybody, says that, come on, but everybody knew that it was just to buy time for Ukraine to prepare for war. We cheated Russians. Ha ha ha. Okay, that, that was exactly what Russians told and Putin said and, and others said to the West uh, eight years. And they said, oh, come on. We are very serious about Minsk agreement. Now they say, no, we were never serious. Okay, uh, you might see it as a normal, cynical political game, which probably it is, but uh, such games has, uh, his, uh, has consequences and we see it then. So, Mr. Blukhanov, you said earlier that about seven to 800,000 people left when the, war, when the war began. People were just so fed up and they were so upset and they left. And presumably these are people who had deep pockets and who could afford to leave and, you know, wealthy Russians. But there are also stories about how uh, less wealthy Russians, more middle class or poorer people who, especially, especially families with young men who are going to be conscripted and did not want to send their young boys to die in a war which they did not agree with. A lot of those people also tried to escape. So how, why are you trying to, so why did people want, obviously there's a problem there. Obviously, there is a problem. And more than that, I, I would expect that uh, uh, demographic uh, uh, trajectory of Russia and uh, the uh, uh, performance of human potential uh, will be damaged for years, of, uh, if not decades to come. No doubt about that. So what? That, that's a crisis uh, of uh, historical scale. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, you and mentioned those... you're willing those to pay with... the price, and Russia is willing to pay the price for that, for sending its young men to war. Uh, as, as you see what is happening, yes. And uh, yes, if, yes, you ask, yes, if you yes. ask... If you ask many people here, uh, mm -hmm. those who stayed, those, those who <laughs> had no, uh, no idea to leave, I would say they will... Uh, Many of them will justify it. I mean, this 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 development and the the conflict. Uh, many of them would blame those who left for being non-patriotic. Others will not do it. But uh, you know, that's uh, that's a split which is continuation of uh, of a very deep-rooted historic process which started uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. We are still there. By the way, you mentioned those with deep pockets. And I think that that's one of very interesting uh, consequences, probably not the, the most important one, but, but one a very interesting one of uh, this development. Those with deep pockets suddenly discovered that uh, if, with all their money mm -hmm. frequently deposited in the West, uh, they are not there. They belong not to the West. And... Uh, now, uh, even those Russians, uh, Russian oligarchs on the well, or wealthy people, wealthy businessmen who have nothing to do with the politics, uh, policy of Russian state, but uh, they face uh, uh, their um, uh, assets uh, be frozen in Switzerland, in US, in Europe, and uh, they will be judged as being Russians. So it doesn't matter how deep your pocket is. And I think, by the way, it's, uh, it's another very interesting uh, uh, consequence of what is happening, this self-identification, so to say. Mm -hmm. But do you think, Mr. Lukianov, that the people who left, that they are non-patriotic? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think uh, it's much more complicated. Some people who left are certainly non-patriotic and they, they are very much anti-Russian uh, uh, minded. No doubt about that. Mm -hmm. uh, many other people whom I know, for example, they are patriotic, but they are they are they are afraid, they are scared, they they are not prepared to go to war, or they don't support this 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 war. Uh, so that that's a very big human drama, no doubt about that. But in this idea of the alternative that the Russians are trying to um, evolve, or your president is trying, it seems to me here, sitting here in Delhi that you're using the Chinese to, uh, to create this idea of this alternative. And the reason I say this is because uh, China's top dipl diplomat Wang Yi has been in Moscow uh, the last couple of days. And even over the last few months, this idea of this very special partnership between Russia and China, that's a very evident one, isn't it? 
Uh, you know, first of all, you mentioned, uh, you, you used the word using China. I don't think that anybody can use China. So China is beyond <laughs> usage, so to say. Mm -hmm. uh, China, China and Russia objectively are now uh, found themselves in, in the same boat. And that was not the Russian um, uh, work which, which uh, brought us uh, there. That was mainly the work of the United States, because you see uh, that Americans officially proclaim uh, China to be the main rival uh, for years, if not decades, to come strategic rival. And uh, from the point of view of classical strategic thinking, it's, it's quite interesting that Americans are ready to antagonize two great powers at once, both China and Russia, but they do it. Probably they believe it's 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 better uh, for shaping uh, the whole global competition in in a more or less ideological or quasi ideological way. But Chinese are, as as we know and as we see, Chinese are very cautious. Chinese are not interested to directly and openly support uh, Russian uh, armed uh, actions in Ukraine. But at the same time, Chinese look at all this uh, from the point of view of big trends. And the big trend is that uh, there is a fight uh, between hegemony, I mean hegemony in, in the uh, terminological sense, mm -hmm. and those who uh, represent the trend against hegemony. Mm -hmm. So it's quite ironic that Russia found itself on the front line because Russia is not the country which aspires international world hegemony and has no resources for that. Uh, China is, and China has, but uh, that's uh, that's an irony again. And for Chinese, uh, probably it's very uh, comfortable actually. But objectively, we are on the same on the same side. And again, Americans, by in their attempts to strengthen the uh, leadership, the dominance in the world they contribute to this uh, rapprochement. But you know, it's interesting that you, fe you feel that you are on the same side. I mean, that's very clear. But you do know surely that the Chinese look at you as a junior partner. They don't look at you as equals. Uh, first of all, I don't think that anybody looks at anybody in international affairs as, 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 as an equal. I think it's a completely wrong uh, description of how international politics uh, works. Uh, do the United States look at anybody as an equal? No. Do, uh, but clearly, because Russia... the you know, Americans do not look upon you as an equal, you are trying to uh, evolve an alternative world order, and you are asking the Chinese or you are partnering with the Chinese in the evolution or this attempt to evolve an, an alternative world order. But the Chinese, unfortunately, are not interested in looking at you as, as an equal or as a fellow partner. That's your view. It's not my view. I okay. don't think that is correct. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's correct. Okay. Uh, Russia and China are asymmetric, no doubt about that. Uh, Russia has its advantages. Russia, uh, China has its advantages. But again, I don't think it's about equality because the international system which uh, we are entering mm -hmm. is not about equality at all. It's a combination of many uh, countries of different size, uh, bigger, smaller, middle-sized powers, which will have different kind of impact on international constellation. And this impact will be huge. So look at, I don't know, look at Turkey. Turkey's role in, in the world today is absolutely disproportionate to the real size and the real capacity, but it is, and so on. Will Russia be a superpower again? No. Will Russia be a great power as it wants to be? I doubt. Will Russia be uh, the mo the, the, one of the most uh, influential international players? No doubt about that. And that uh, will be uh, uh, taken into account by all, uh, including Chinese. Uh, Mr. Lukianov, you mentioned Turkey, but let me say, uh, let me talk about India a little bit. I mean, sitting here in Delhi, of course, India continues to buy uh, oil from Russia, hugely discounted prices going against the American advice uh, and sanctions, uh, may I add. But I also want to say that the Indians are deeply worried that this war is going to continue in Ukraine and really want an end to the war. Because 
here you see that this is that you know there are other problems to deal with you just coming off the covid pandemic there is so much other in inequality in the world debt traps everywhere why must you have another war with ukraine uh, it's a good question but you know both of us studied uh, history of international relations and we know exactly that the fact that everybody is worried about the war uh cannot uh, stop this war the war stops when uh, objective uh, circumstances coincide when one side or or other side wins a victory or when both sides feel that they cannot achieve anything uh, uh, else uh, can cannot achieve more by by using military force then we can arrive to the next stage when uh, peace uh, negotiations or settlement negotiations will start. We are not there yet. We will certainly be there, but not uh, yet. And uh, uh, it doesn't matter how much India, Turkey, Russia, or uh, Qatar uh, are worried about this war. But India could, I mean, India is also deeply concerned that Russia and China are coming together so closely because, as you know, India has several problems with China, including. The fact that the Chinese are aggressing on India's borders and that hasn't changed. That hasn't changed, and I think that uh, this uh, this is an issue which should be very, very uh, actively addressed by diplomacy, Indian diplomacy, Chinese diplomacy. Uh, I would even uh, say Russian diplomacy, but simply I don't think that Russian diplomacy may be very, very helpful there. Uh, you know, the uh, worries in India and the concerns in India are very well received and understood here, mm -hmm. at least by me. I, I, I know that uh, very well. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, uh, look at uh, the uh, paradoxical world we live in today. Uh, China and U.S. are deeply engaged in strategic competition which uh, with the trend with the tendency to grow mm -hmm. uh, at the same time last year was a record uh, trade uh, mark they they reached that's right it was a recent a recently published uh, uh, data yeah india and china with all extremely complicated relationship as I understand, economically, that's a very solid base for relationship. And so on. So even the fact that Russian gas uh, is not flowing to Europe through Nord Stream anymore for very well-known reasons, but it's still going through Ukrainian territory without any problems. That shows that, that the world today is... Uh, uh, slightly different than uh, 100 or uh, 75 years ago. And uh, in this regard, uh, yes, of course, a relationship between China and India uh, will need to be addressed very seriously. Relationship between Russia and China certainly will change and will need to be adjusted to the ever-changing situation. So I assure you that there are no naive people here in Moscow who would believe that uh, our uh, partnership without limits will be flourishing and uh, be uh, very nice uh, forever of course not but this is a normal uh, this is a norm for international relations now we have this situation we address it uh, afterwards we will have another uh, constellation of circumstances we will address them do you certainly don't consider yourself uh, as a junior partner to the chinese uh, personally, no, I don't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Last couple of questions, Mr. Lukianov. I want to come back to you on the Nord Stream pipeline. There have been uh, uh, stories in the West by Seymour Hirsch, the well-known investigative journalist, that the Nord Stream pipeline was uh, was destroyed or damaged by American, um, you know, well, deep sea divers who uh, work for the Pentagon. That story was denied. What is the reaction in Moscow? Uh, reaction in Moscow is, uh, of course, we told you so, because uh, that was in from the beginning, uh, the very strong belief that the only part in uh, all this uh, combination 
which would be uh, interested to do it was uh, the United States. And it's, it's very logical, actually, in the uh, uh, if, if we take the logic of a severe uh, confrontation. Uh, of course, I don't know. I, I know that Mr. Hirsch uh, is a very esteemed investigative journalist with uh, serious uh, stories, uh, confirmed stories before. Uh, I don't see this story incredible or so to say contradicting the the again the logic of of situation whether it is correct or not i don't know what what is uh, absolutely stunning to me uh, you mentioned that uh, a reaction so okay probably okay let's assume it's wrong it's not correct mm -hmm. but then at least and the Americans and Germans uh, in the first line who suffered this uh, damage, yeah. they should uh, make their own uh, uh, assessment and investigation in what uh, uh, Hirsch uh, published and probably denied by facts and so on. What we see, we see that uh, mainstream media, they simply ignore it. Unlike what happened in Vietnam when Hirsch published this My Life story or Abu Ghraib story, that was a big uh, bomb in, 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 in the whole Western media sphere. Not at all, nothing uh, like this now. And um, uh, I was very uh, amused by a conversation with a, with a friend of mine, the, the colleague of mine in, in the United States. It was just recently. I asked him um, about the reaction. Uh, in the US, why why reaction is non-existing. And he said, oh, come on, that's just garbage. That's just garbage. It doesn't doesn't make sense to even discuss. When when we publish something about Russian malign activities, that's serious. That's based on on on, on data, on intelligence. But what Hirsch uh, wrote, that's that's just garbage. Okay, so with such approach, yeah, great. <laughs> So speaking of Germany, uh, uh, Mr. Lukyana, Germany and Russia have been so interdependent, not just over the last 30 years since the Soviet Union broke up, but even before. Now, the Germans have turned against you. You know, it's, it's really the last bastion in a sense, because they were, you know, both Russia and the Germans were so close economically, you know, strategically, in so many other ways. So do the Russians feel, do you feel that you're out in the cold? No, Russians don't feel that, be sure, especially not because of Germany. So that's uh, what happened between Russia and Germany, and in particular between Russia and the European Union. Uh, that was a really fantastic development, uh, fantastic because of, the, uh, of its uh, total irrationality. Uh, relationship between Russia and Germany was so unbelievably favorable for both sides i mean economically uh, culturally politically that uh, we could not imagine a year ago that this relationship can be disrupted even by such big events like uh, what we have now but it happened and uh, first of all we saw that actually everything is possible in today's world even like this and that's about uh, contradicting to what I said before about economic interconnection, that economic interconnection is very important, but it, at certain points it can be overthrown and just, just once. Uh, and, uh, you know, the relationship, the perception of Germany and Russia is very special for obvious reasons. And we uh, felt uh, very proud uh, for many decades that we did overcome this terrible uh, experience, historical experience, which we had uh, during the Second World War. Now, since Germany is being perceived as a country which supports purely and highly anti-Russian forces, and by the way, those forces, uh, whatever they deny, they have uh, some flower of... Uh, uh, nazism and nazi, nazi romanticism mm -hmm. uh, so it has been perceived as uh, uh, the comeback of traditional problem which we had with germans backside of that is that since we saw it many many times before those this pendulum uh, i think at the end of the day not immediately not soon 
but uh, the economic necessity, economic rationality will, will bring us back. I mean, Germans and Russians, but it, we are very far away from that. And the fact that uh, this relationship uh, has been, economic relationship has been destroyed, that's bad for both sides, but this is new life. It will not be recovered anytime soon. But you've also, you're also on record as saying that Joe Biden's visit to Ukraine, to Kiev, a few days ago, was a very bold move and that, you, uh, that you're adm admiring of it. I'm not admiring, but I think it was, yes, it was a very bold move. And in the PR terms, it was great. So congratulations. Just in PR terms, you don't think that it, is, it was an underlining of the fact that, that the West is hanging together and that Russia is now on the other side? But w w why should he do uh, another, uh, uh, why should he demonstrate uh, uh, that uh, once again? Because I think it's obvious that the West is consolidated and Russia is on the other side. So what? So why do you think it's a bold move then? Uh, from the PR point of view, because he was c courageous uh, enough to come. And uh, there were some information that it was uh, some kind of communication between, Rus between American and Russian special services and they got assurances that Russia will not harm Biden. Good. That's that's a that's an element of culture which still <laughs> still uh, exists. Uh, but otherwise, uh, uh, you know, the to, today's world is so much uh, full of uh, big moves, PR moves, which will be forgotten the day after tomorrow. That I would not overestimate it. So just this, just this. Uh, so-called PR move that you're talking about, that when Biden goes to Kiev, he sends a message or his establishment sends a message to the Russians that he is going to Kiev, right? What did that mean? That mean that, that Biden uh, positions himself as, as a great leader. Uh, by the way, he uh, will announce very soon that he will run for the presidency in the United States again. And in this uh, context, it's important for him as well. So it's very, very clear. For Russia, what does it mean for Russia? Okay, it's very nice from, from the Biden, uh, from, from Mr. Biden to, to send this message to confirm what we knew even before. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't say it uh, did change anything in our perception. Now, the, absolutely the last question, Mr. Lukyana. The Indians are continuing to buy large quantities of oil from Russia. What what is your view on that, or what is the Russian view? What is the Russian reaction? That's very simple. Indians uh, has always been very good uh, uh, rational players when it comes to Indian national interests. It's extremely good for India to use this situation to buy uh, cheap oil in big uh, quantities. Why don't use it? We are grateful because we need it as well. So that's very natural uh, exchange. But isn't it more like a? Is it? It's it's purely a transactional sort of an in, a thing, isn't it? It's it's hardly um, strategic, leave alone tactical. I don't think it's strategic. It's very much tactical. But uh, what is strategic in uh, today's environment? I don't see many of strategic uh, relationship in traditional uh, traditional um, uh, sense uh, at the same time what is uh, what is important what is important uh, lesson of yeah. this year and it has to do with india as well i think uh, for me uh, surprise the surprise was that united states failed to recruit anybody beyond their official alliances to join anti-Russian coalition, to join officially join anti-Russian uh, group to in, introduce sanctions and so on. Uh, it does not mean, of course, that uh, the rest of the world supports Russia. I have no illusions about that. But it does mean that no one wants to follow instructions from Washington anymore. And that's a very important change. But are the Russian people going to bite their tongue and grit their teeth and follow the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, and whatever moves he makes in the coming few weeks and months on the Ukraine crisis, no matter uh, how many people are killed. I have no crystal ball, unfortunately. I don't know. So I can say just one thing. So far, I don't see any signs of uh, split in society which could lead to uh, significant resistance 
to what uh, decision makers will will make no not at all whether it will uh, last for longer period or not no idea but uh, uh, quite uh, illustratively we had very bad period uh, last fall mm -hmm. when russia suffered uh, serious defeats on on the battlefield mm -hmm. and the whole world celebrated i mean the west and ukrainians celebrated that russia is almost almost done uh first of all it was a bit premature and secondly it was a very bad feeling in society but it was a feeling uh, with no uh, potential to to put pressure on the power to change the course profoundly so that's why i think that uh, we can expect same reaction in in the future mr fyodor lukyanov thank you for speaking so frankly and freely and thank you so much for your time speaking to thank you thank you again